Good evening. My name is Jessica Roman, and I hold the distinct pleasure of acting as program manager for the incredible Center for Digestive Health team here at Virginia Mason Franciscan Health. It is my pleasure to welcome you to tonight's lecture. We host a lecture series yearly on a host of topics of digestive concerns. The Center for Digestive Health is comprised of a team of pathologists, gastroenterologists, surgeons, oncologists, endocrinologists, and radiologists who are looking to optimize care of the patient through our culture of quality, focus on access, innovations in research, and educating the next generation of caregivers. By emphasizing innovative and quality patient care, research, and education, we provide excellence in our clinical programs, including Center for Weight Management, featuring bariatric surgery, medical weight loss, GI cancer prevention, colon and rectal disorders, esophageal, liver, pancreas, and biliary diseases, as well as IBS and motility disorders. Education and research is truly embedded in everything that we do. Our team of providers from multiple specialties work together to improve your health and well-being, teach the world about what we do best, translate cutting edge research from lab to bedside, pursue quality initiatives to provide the very best care, and discover innovations to transform your experience. Since 1982, our national breakthroughs have impacted treatment of digestive disease at the regional, national, and international levels. And while we feel that digestive health at Virginia Mason Franciscan Health is very special, we have been honored to be awarded numerous accolades over the years, a reflection of the hard work of our providers and their dedication to their patients. Our presenters this evening are Dr. Justin Brandler and advanced practitioner Diana McFarland. Dr. Justin Brandler completed his medical degree at the University of Washington and his internal med medicine residency at the Mayo Clinic Rochester. While at the Mayo Clinic, he completed a clinical research fellowship and then went on to complete a gastroenterology fellowship at the University of Michigan before joining Virginia Mason Franciscan Health in 2022 as the medical director of the IBS and Motility Disorders Program. Diana McFarland completed her advanced practitioner education at A.T. Still University in Arizona with a master's degree in physician assistant studies. Diana joined Virginia Mason Franciscan Health in 2007, where she specializes in gastroenterology with a focus in bowel disorders like IBS. We're so honored to have both Dr. Brandler and Diana McFarland speaking this evening and look forward to engaging in discussion with them during our Q&A session following their presentations. Good evening, Jessica, thank you so much for your introduction. I'm Diana McFarland. I'm a physician assistant in the gastroenterology section at Virginia Mason. Tonight we're going to talk about IBS, but with a constipation predominance. And then following me tonight, Dr. Brandler will talk about uh, the diarrhea side of the picture. So let's just start by talking about how the bowel works. What does the colon do? The colon is otherwise known as the large bowel or the large intestine. And this accepts basically liquid contents from your small intestine. As your food has gone through your intestine, there have been secretions, liquid added, liquid taken away, and things have been digested. And what's left over is anything not digested and any of the leftover liquid. So it comes into the colon as a liquid. And as your stool then goes through the course of the colon, it's about five feet for most people, the liquid from that content is absorbed. And so as that liquid is absorbed, along the way, the stool goes from very liquid to very solid. And it pushes the stool forward then into the rectum. So at the bottom of the colon, you have this rectal cavity here. And at the bottom of that is the anal sphincter, which is a muscle. And that controls holding stool, letting you know when the rectum is full and it's time to go to the bathroom, but then keeping it in until it's time to go and signaling when you're about to start a bowel movement. When you're actually releasing the stool and gas, it's the rectum and anal sphincter who are the stars of the show. So constipation is so common. Um, and this is one of the most common things I see in my practice every day. Up to one in four Americans suffer from constipation symptoms at one time or another in their lifetime. And there are many factors and contributing risk factors to constipation that we consider in the clinic when we meet for consultation. We'll talk about what's your diet like? Are you eating enough fiber? 
Um, how old are you? What stages of life have you gone through? How much are you able to exercise and does that help you with your bowel habits? Females definitely have constipation more often than men, so gender can play a role. Oftentimes, medication side effects can compound together to worsen constipation or create constipation symptoms. And really importantly, people who suffer from defecation disorder or problems getting the bowel movement out of their body will then end up having problems with constipation. And if we don't take that into account, we're going to miss a lot of the picture. So there are a lot of misconceptions about constipation. I thought I would highlight a few of them today so that we can maybe get some of those out of the picture for you. And I'm happy to answer more questions for you as well later tonight. So holding stool in the colon is uncomfortable. Gas, bloating, cramping, pain, fullness, it can make it hard to eat. But it doesn't actually create a toxicity in your body to hold on to colon stool. The stool is not absorbed into the body, so it's not actually creating a toxicity, but it can feel pretty unwell. Menstruation hormones can sometimes make stools a little more frequent or, or cause some diarrhea symptoms during some parts of the menstrual cycle, but it doesn't tend to have much of an impact on constipation. And we always talk a lot about increasing fiber in the diet, increasing fluid in the diet, increasing physical activity. But if those pieces are always in place, adding more of it doesn't always fix constipation. But we'll definitely talk about those components in, in a GI consultation. There are a small percentage of patients who actually get worse when they eat more fiber or take more fiber supplements. So we can tease that apart in the consult as well. So it's true to say high fiber doesn't always treat constipation. That's definitely a true statement. Laxatives kind of have you know, a bad name on the street, but more recent understanding of the way laxatives are used and how they work indicate that for the most part, as long as they're not overused at really high doses for a long period of time, they actually tend to be very well tolerated and they're a good tool for us to employ in the management of constipation. And as you may know, those are often available over the counter. So the way I think about constipation is, am I dealing with a very slow colon or am I dealing with a defecation disorder where it's hard to get the bowel movement out of the body or both things? And sometimes it's both things. In fact, a lot of times it's both. And we have to work on both pieces of this to improve constipation symptoms. But tonight we're focusing on IBS. So you can have constipation and not have IBS, but we're talking about IBS tonight. So it's important to remember that irritable bowel syndrome with constipation predominance has a few different meanings that we have to sort out. And we talk about this in clinic. To what degree are you experiencing pain in your abdominal cavity? Is that pain episodic, happening intermittently? And most importantly, when it comes to IBS, is that pain related to either needing to have a bowel movement or the fact that your bowel movements are too slow, too infrequent, or that they're too hard? So changes related to pain as it pertains to defecation, change in stool frequency, or change in stool form. So for that constipated patient, you're going to have a predominance of hard stools. That doesn't mean for a constipated patient you have to have hard stools all the time. It just means that a lot of the time the stools are really hard and dry. So I've circled that in green on this picture, kind of very dehydrated, small, pellet-like bowel movements, or very hard, compact, very bumpy stools that aren't smooth and malleable and easy to get out. Someone with IBS constipation can still have diarrhea too. It's just not the most predominant or frequent symptom. So to meet the criteria for irritable bowel syndrome, you talk with your gastroenterology provider about these symptoms, how frequently they're occurring, and also be aware that IBS is a chronic syndrome. So we're expecting to find out that these symptoms have been present for at least several months at a minimum, if not years. So we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about that, that defecation piece, because just, just think about it this way. If you can't get all the stool out of your body, it's going to back up, and it will result in a feeling of or symptoms of constipation, right? So how do we understand to what degree defecation disorder is affecting your bowel movements? Well, first of all, I start with asking some questions. Is it hard to start your bowel movement? Is it hard to finish your bowel movement? Do you feel like there's a blockage or obstruction to being able to get a bowel movement out of your body? 
Can you even tell when you need to have a bowel movement? How do you know? What sensations do you get in your abdomen or in your rectum when you know you need to go to the bathroom? So one of the specialty tests that I utilize in my clinic is called anal rectal manometry. And as you can see in this picture, there's a little catheter um, that goes into the rectum. It has a deflated balloon on it. And then as we inflate that balloon, we can start to see where your sensation lies. As the balloon fills, your rectum will start to stretch, and we can see when you start to tell that you need to go to the bathroom. That information will record down. We'll also have you squeeze on the catheter. So we'll have you do Kegel exercises to squeeze the anal sphincter around that catheter, and we'll measure the strength of that sphincter. And then really importantly, when it comes to having a bowel movement, we'll ask you to try to actually push that balloon out. And that will let us see if you're able to relax and open up the bottom of the pelvic floor to let stool out of the body. And this is just a pretty colorful picture, but it shows us the pressure measurements as you go through these functional steps. So like it's red when you're contracting the anal sphincter, and then the colors get lighter as you're passing a bowel movement through. So this is a way that we can understand the nerves, sensation, and function around bowel movement and defecation. We often will combine it with a second test, and this is a radiology test called a defecography. I've got pictures of the radiology test here showing that there's contrast in the rectum, and we go through those same motions. We have the patient squeeze, we have them push to evacuate, and then we look to see if there's any evidence that their muscles are holding stool in. We also look to see if there's something called rectocele and intussusception, which basically just means some structural changes inside the rectum that are preventing or obstructing a full bowel movement from coming outside of the body when you attempt to have a bowel movement. So we can tell those types of changes on the, the x-ray. When we put these two pieces of information together, the x-ray studies and the anorectal manometry study, we can really get a good sense of what's going wrong with bowel movements. And absolutely, these tests are in an intimate part of your body, and so we always talk ahead of time about what we're looking at, how we're doing it. We do it in a very respectful way, but we also talk about if it's the right test for you. We don't make you do it if you don't want to, but it can be really helpful. It's also important just to pause here and make sure that we've done something for safety, and that is to rule out red flag symptoms. So sometimes if someone has a colon polyp, for example, or even a colon cancer, they can have a change in their bowel habits. They can have normal bowel habits and then get constipated, or they can have normal bowel habits and then get diarrhea. So it's important that we screen for what we call red flag symptoms, unintentional weight loss, any evidence of blood in the stool, anemia, iron deficiency. In your family, has there been a history of colon cancer or colon polyps? Any new symptoms that start brand new after the age of 50, it's important to give special attention to that. And in those situations, you might talk to your gastroenterology provider about a colonoscopy or special imaging tests. So for treatments, we focus first on diet and lifestyle. Like I talked about at the beginning tonight, we talk about do you have a high fiber diet? If you don't, let's try adding fiber. Do you drink enough water? You don't have to drink an excess amount of water, but you have to drink at least enough water. Enough water is different for everybody, and it also can be dependent on your other medical conditions and medications. But in general, I'm aiming for 50 to 60 ounces a day for most people. Do you exercise regularly? The colon loves whole body movement. So this is where it's great to walk, to swim, to use an elliptical machine. Anything that moves your entire body, moves all four limbs, can really help with colonic motility. And then we also need to talk about just how you have a bowel movement avoidance of straining, the correct positioning, how you breathe, all of these things can change the success of a full bowel movement. So fiber. Fiber can feel a little bit intimidating and confusing. There's fiber in the diet. There's fiber supplements. What do you do? Well, a high fiber diet means eating four to six servings of fruits and vegetables a day, whole grains, nuts, seeds, those kinds of foods. And you want to get 25 to 30 grams of fiber a day. But sometimes, especially given our busy lifestyle, we're not able to get in as much fiber as we really aim to. And so that's where fiber supplements can help fill in the gap. Different types of fiber supplements are out there. There's insoluble fiber, and those don't break down in water or dissolve in water quite as well. 
those will actually stimulate the lining of the colon and secrete more mucus and water into the stool. Soluble fiber does dissolve in water and it creates kind of a gel and that can hold water in the lumen and help keep water balanced. So both kinds of fibers can be helpful. There are some other fibers out there that actually don't have any improvement on bowel habits and they can increase bloating. So it's good to talk about if those are present in your diet, they could be contributing to constipation and bloating symptoms. And that's like wheat dextrin, artificial sweeteners, and sometimes inulin. Um, fiber also lowers cholesterol and imp improves glycemic control. So it has other health benefits. And the biggest risk with fiber is it's either not going to work or it's going to make you bloated. So it's important to start at a low dose, take a single daily dose to start with, with at least eight ounces of water, and then over the course of several weeks, you'll increase that dose to the point that you feel more comfortable. And sometimes switching brands can help if you feel somewhat bloated. When fiber and diet and lifestyle don't work, we can add either osmotic and or stimulant laxatives. And I always talk about titration. We want to use just enough to give you that form stool, but not so much that you're having diarrhea. If a constipation treatment is making you have diarrhea, we need to talk and adjust the regimen. So osmotic laxatives would be like Miralax, for example, or Magcitrate. Those can be titrated to help put more water into the stool. And stimulant laxatives can help propulse stools forward. So I always think about stimulant laxatives helping with my regularity and osmotic laxatives helping with my stool softness or form. When and if those don't work, you can come see us in the clinic and we can prescribe medications called intestinal secretagogues or, or prokinetic medications that have a little bit stronger mechanism of action to help with these slower moving bowels than the other medications do. I've listed them here, but of course if we came into clinic we'd talk about them in more detail. But lubiprostone is amatiza, linaclotide is linzess, placanatide is trulance, and Motegrity's uh, generic name is um, Prucalipride. Okay, last part of treatment we're going to cover today is all about defecation disorder. So pelvic floor disorder, we talked about how we look at this and how we understand it and how we interpret these studies, but what do we do when we find it? Well, we partner with our specialized pelvic floor physical therapists who have extra credentials in pelvic floor health, and they use multiple different tools. So First of all, biofeedback, and I'll show you a picture of that next, is used to adjust abdominal pressure, improve pelvic relaxation, and importantly, improve muscle coordination to effectively defecate. And if used appropriately, this can improve constipation significantly by itself. And in one study, we had 65% of patients have normalized colonic transit after pelvic floor physical therapy. This is done over the course of teaching, learning, practicing at home, and several sessions. And sometimes we'll use rectal sensation retraining and practice defecation in the pelvic floor clinic. This is a picture of what the um, biofeedback equipment looks like. These little electrodes that you can see on the right-hand side, they're attached to stickers on the outside of your pelvis that help us measure your muscle contractions. And then the therapist can work directly with you to show you how your muscle contractions are working. Um, in the process of improving your pelvic floor function. And that can really help you understand that you're doing the exercises correctly and strong enough, or your muscles are too strong and we need to relax them a little bit more. So this slide is a picture of the algorithm we created at Virginia Mason to help us work through constipation because it can be quite a problematic um, disorder, especially if it doesn't respond to kind of those first line treatments. So we definitely work in a multidisciplinary manner. We're always going to try for diet and lifestyle first before we add medications. But we'll use these diagnostic tests as I described. We'll incorporate pelvic floor physical therapy. And in some situations, we'll actually consult in our multidisciplinary pelvic floor group and work with our colorectal surgeons, our gynecologists, and our urogynecologists to sort out the best long-term management plan. In addition to that, we do also have dietitians in our practice who can help with balancing the diet and lifestyle as well. So I'll turn it over to Dr. Brandler, and then afterwards I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much. Hello, my name is Dr. Justin Brandler, and I'm a neurogastroenterologist and motility specialist at Virginia Mason Franciscan Health. I am so glad that you're here joining us virtually and hopefully later for the Q&A session to talk about some 
evidence-based tools to really transform what a lot of our patients are experiencing as a chaotic bowel situation into more control over your lives. Both myself and Diana McFarland, my colleague, are going to hopefully really empower you all with some tools to feel quite a bit of hope for a lot of these hopeless type of conditions. So another thing I really want to set the stage for now early on is that we're going to cover a lot of ground together. Um, and the purpose here isn't for you to pick up every single bit and piece because you have a recording actually. So that'll be really helpful for you to be able to go back. It's more to get a bird's eye view of IBS in 2023 and what tools do we have to help you, especially here at VMFH. So we're going to go back to school. We're going to go to stool school and get some fundamentals in terms of our um, ways we approach things from a clinical standpoint to teach you as well. We're also going to talk about what IBS is and in some ways, most importantly, what it is not in terms of other types of conditions or other things. Um, we're also going to empower you today with what I call an IBS snapshot. And it kind of harkens back to another talk I gave that really seemed to get a lot of traction with patient advocacy groups of really trying to empower you when you have so many symptoms, a lot of times decades worth of symptoms going into a visit, and how do you really distill that down into a, um, a usable format, both for you and for the provider that you're seeing? Um, in my talk, we're going to focus on IBS diarrhea predominant, and so we're going to talk about some healing evidence-based therapies in a lot of different realms, such as meds, nutrition, psychology, and even go into some digital tools to help. Um, and we're also going to really highlight the integrated team approach that we have here uniquely at VMFH that I'm just so blessed to be able to work with this amazing team of providers. If you take nothing else away from today's talk is that I really want you to understand and believe that there is hope for IBS and actually a lot of it. There are a lot of different tools and in some ways it's really important to think about what are the most important tools that you would like to explore with your provider um, to get yourself to that quality of life that you're looking for. So no talk that I give is almost without the gastroenterologist's BFF, which is the Bristol stool chart. So stool is all in the eye of the beholder because as you can imagine, you know, one patient's diarrhea is another patient's constipation. And so this really gets us apples to apples in terms of what does constipation mean to you and what does it mean to me? So you really have to lift up that toilet seat sometimes and actually look in there of what's actually happening so that we have a better sense of what's going on so that we can tailor your treatment strategy accordingly. The reason why this is important is also how we frame our diagnoses. So in the IBS realm, there's IBS constipation predominant. So if you look on what I call the lumpy bumpy axis, so that Y axis where it's kind of the rabbit turds basically of how much of that is going on in your bowel movements versus on the X axis there is more the loosey goosiness of your bowel movements. How liquid are they? And some patients, it can be a mixture of both, but it really helps to get a sense of how much is happening in either direction. And for both research purposes as well as clinical purposes, we use kind of a 25% of your bowel movements overall in the past two weeks or so cut off to really give us a threshold of are you more IBS-C, are you more IBS-D, or sometimes in those mixed patients. So now we'll talk about what IBS is. So my, one of my mentors at Mayo Clinic, Dr. Michael Camilleri, published this on the peripheral mechanisms, meaning um, throughout the whole body mechanisms of irritable bowel syndrome. And there's a lot going on in these patients, OK? Um, so irritable is the I in this um, acronym. And in these patients, it's abdominal pain or discomfort, as well as association with abnormal bowel movements based off those Bristol stool types we talked about. Um, it's usually constipation or diarrhea. Gas and bloating is also a large proponent of a lot of patients, but it can be both or neither. It has very complex physiology going on here. Um, and it is considered under the umbrella term of disorders of brain-gut interaction. Um, now, this kind of harkens into a metaphor that I often use in my specialty of neurogastroenterology to really explain what is, what is going on here. So if you think of 
a, an orchestra, okay? So it's comprised of a conductor. So the conductor here is our brain, okay? But the conductor has to communicate with our guts, which is the orchestra, okay? But it's a bi-directional, meaning both directions are speaking to each other relationships. So the conductor has to listen to the music the orchestra is producing and vice versa to really hopefully create a more melodious stool symphony by the end that hopefully is what you want. And that is neurogastroenterology in a nutshell, the brain-gut connection. A lot of patients, this is a fun fact, there are as many neurons or nerve cells in the guts as there is in the spinal cord. So there's an intense connection between the two in terms of the neurotransmitters, in terms of other types of signals that are sent between the two that we actually harness to create a treatment plan for patients. Now also it's important to discuss what IBS is not. So IBS is not IBD, okay? So that's inflammatory bowel disease, which you've probably heard of. That's Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, microscopic colitis. Those are obviously very important conditions and actually patients when their inflammation gets under control can have an overlap of IBS, but IBS at its core is not those things. IBS is also not fatal. However, it does really affect the quality of life for patients, even though it may not affect the quantity of life. Um, and actually, quality of life is one of the most significant impactors for these patients, comparable to even other chronic lung conditions, other types of things. That, that's why I'm so passionate about trying to focus on this, to really give patients their quality of life back. The other really important thing to drive home is, is that IBS is not all in your head, regardless of what you've been told maybe by other providers or other people in your lives, um, because these symptoms are real. These symptoms are real for you. You're experiencing them. They're affecting your life, your family's life. However, I think it's also really important to recognize that the brain can often worsen the problem. And if we totally take out the brain from the whole picture, we could actually leave on the table some really effective therapies that both affect the brain and the gut connection. And that's why we do call them these disorders of gut-brain interaction. So really one thing to make the most out of your GI visit is taking some time of self-reflection going into that visit. So spending some time reflecting on what are your predominant symptoms that you're experiencing. Are you more an upper GI person? Do you have like discomfort after eating, maybe nausea, vomiting? Are you more a lower GI person? Do you have discomfort surrounding bowel movements? Is it this constipation, diarrhea, madness? Um, or what I kind of call the hot mess express situation where it's all the things, you have all the symptoms um, because it is kind of one big highway, right? Um, and sometimes like I-5, it can get backed up or all these other things can happen and the whole system is affected. Then it's important to really ask yourself, you know, timing. So when was the last time my GI health was actually even good or decent? Because sometimes that can give us a sense of, was there an event, was there a surgery? Was there a ton of antibiotics you were given for some reason? Was there a major life stressor that really triggered these symptoms? Now, sometimes it's hard to pinpoint it. You've been dealing with this for 10, 20 years, and that's okay. But sometimes if you can pinpoint that, that can really help us as providers. Also trying to get a sense of timing here in terms of number of days out of the week that you're having symptoms, because sometimes it's just, eh, this is just once in a while versus this is a daily struggle for me. Um, also thinking about triggering um, and triggers of your symptoms. Every patient is different. That's what's kind of fun about this, but what can also be pretty maddening is that different patients have different triggers. Um, and then we focus our treatment accordingly. So is it bowel movements, right, that are triggering my pain, my bloating, or it feels better after I have a bowel movement? Is it foods? So like, you know, spicy foods, pizza, cheeses, those types of things. Is it gas bloating? Is that a big problem for me? Is it stress that really I sense a really big connection with? When I'm doing a presentation before work, I always get this rumblies in my tumbly or anxious diarrhea or those types of things. Um, alcohol can also be a trigger for some patients, especially with more upper GI symptoms. So then really, and this can be a really helpful tool for providers, is 
What about prior treatments? A lot of times, especially if you've been on decades worth of treatments, it can be kind of maddening of what have I tried, what have I not tried, what was that red pill, I can't remember. So really trying to think about what have I tried, how long did I try it, and what happened when I tried it? Was it effective, was it not effective? Did I have side effects from it? Also thinking about what am I interested in trying, especially after we discuss some of these other tools that you could use, and then what would I not like to try, and really trying to have reasons why you wouldn't like to try them. And there can be very legitimate reasons, concerns about side effects and those types of things. I would encourage you to keep an open mind, though, for some of the treatments that we have, because there's a lot of fear around side effects, especially surrounding the low-dose antidepressants that we use, but they can actually be really effective tools for patients that we don't want to take off the table um, unnecessarily. So really thinking about, do I want a pill-based approach? Do I want a nutrition-based approach? Do I want more meditative psychological type of approach? Um, or an integrative medicine type of approach with supplements, as there is some evidence definitely surrounding these. Um, then really going to your medicine cabinet of old and really looking to see what have I already tried. So, you know, I tried fiber or something and it was this powder I can't remember, it was this orange canister. So like psyllium-based fiber, really knowing that can be helpful. So Metamucil is the most common uh, brand for that. Looking at your pills, you know, I was on this pill, it was something, you know, in the visit, it can become very hard to, when we don't want to go over the road that has been very well traveled already before. So if you've already looked in your medicine cabinet, if you already looked in your portal from before of what medicines I've been tried on before, that can be really helpful for us because while the healthcare, um, while the electronic health record can be a tremendous tool, in some ways it can kind of be like a needle in a haystack when you're in the visit trying to figure out what were they on in 2012 or something like that. So if you come into the visit prepared with that information, it can really help us to have a really quality time together. Then once you've kind of done your data gathering, um, really trying to organize those thoughts and experiences. And this can be really hard and it, we recognize that it can be really hard to put together such chaotic symptoms sometimes and, and such long histories. So sometimes patients come in with these notebooks or now there's symptom trackers uh, through apps that can be helpful. Um, but I wanna have a, a discussion about that. So the pros of this, it can help drive some of that self-reflection as well as discovering some of your triggers. However, a cons is that if you bring in a full notebook with like a ton of different pages and everything, that's not really helpful for us in a limited office visit and sometimes can negatively affect the, the provider interaction. Um, also, it can increase patient anxiety sometimes and almost a fixation on their bowel movements and drive some disordered eating behavior that we don't want. So I would personally recommend no more than two to four weeks of you know, aggressive, I guess, a symptom or trigger recording, just because we don't wanna drive too much anxiety and too much fixation on things. That can give you a pretty decent snapshot of the overarching picture that we're looking at, because we really wanna set both you and the provider up for IBS success in your visits. So, and we're gonna talk about how do you do that in a snapshot of a one page summary. So really trying to get away of, from these notebooks that can sometimes come in. Again, I totally get why they happen and if that's helpful for you, you know, on your own, that's great, but really trying to make the most out of our visit. Now in terms of recording your stool data, there's old school versions and we'll talk about new school versions. So old school would be just a simple pen and paper, right? So you on the side, you put down your dates over a two week period. And then on the top, you really hone in on what are the Bristol stool types that are happening for me and, and trying to record that. So then you just do a simple tally mark system of I had three Bristol sevens. I had, you know, the next day I had two Bristol fives, then I had three Bristol ones, I had a mixture of ones and twos one day, and then I had a ton of sevens, right? So it's this whole mixed bag, and if you were just to experience that without writing it down, you're just gonna be like, my bowel habits are all over the place, because they are, but it really gets a sense of how, wh what are we talking about apples to apples? And then, you know, there are apps actually that can help you calculate this, or you can just do this yourself of, t of 
counting up the number of bowel movements over that period and seeing what percentage am I in the one to twos versus the threes to fives versus the six to sevens, okay? And that's because that marries back to that chart that we discussed earlier of that 25% threshold, which is not a perfect science. By no means do I stick to that specifically in my practice, but it helps us to give an overall picture. So in this patient, they would have had, they would have definitely met that 25% threshold for the ones to twos, but they also would have met the threshold for their sixes to sevens, ultimately leading to this IBS mixed type of group. What I will say about the IBS mixed, though, is that very often this is actually a condition called overflow diarrhea. So let's talk about that. A metaphor I use in this scenario is kind of like a river over rocks. Actually, one of my colleagues, Dr. Herrer at University of Michigan, gave me this metaphor. So this is an x-ray from a patient that I had that I asked her, uh, requested her permission to use, which she was happily uh, willing to share, of her belly x-ray. She came in to me with just she said she unfortunately had loss of bowel hap, loss of bowel control called fecal incontinence, which is really embarrassing, understandably. And really, she described a lot of diarrhea, but her symptoms were not fitting that when we really dove into her stool chart. So we did this x-ray, and we're going to highlight here actually on the x-ray what was shocking to her, um, and but really helpful for our treatment plan was there are a lot of these Bristol 1 to 2 rabbit turds, actually. Um, now, an x-ray is not a perfect modality and less evidence-based, I will say, but especially in these patients, it can actually provide a lot of helpful information when you have all of the stool burden in somebody who says they have some diarrhea, because that's what's showing. And that's because there's this liquid stool, kind of this river, kind of squeaking by the rocks. Now, this can really help in our treatment algorithm for them because in these patients, we sometimes do a bowel prep, which they're like, I have diarrhea. Why would you give me a bowel prep? And they're like looking at you sideways, understandably. But the reason why this can be really helpful is because in that bowel prep, we kind of like break the dam and kind of flush things clean a little bit and then get you started on a consistent bowel regimen, not for the purposes of doing a colonoscopy, but for the purposes of getting a little bit more bowel regularity. And I just had a patient actually two days ago that we did this approach and she's her, she doesn't have any more fecal incontinent episodes and is doing quite well. Again, not for everyone by any means, but can be a really powerful tool. Now, a new school technique in terms of recording symptoms, you know, we have our less is more patients where, you know, we don't need too much information versus our more is more patients, give me all the things. Um, so for our less is more patients, Plop is actually an um, app that I use to track uh, stools once to just figure that out a little bit. It's a little bit more straightforward, I would say, a little bit user friendly, um, more focused on stools. CARA Care is another one that can be helpful. A little bit more data, though, entry that you can do in terms of nutrition, um, other triggers, water intake, those types of things. And then Dieta is probably the most advanced that I've seen and has publications behind it that actually uses artificial intelligence to create algorithms to figure out your triggers. Okay, so this is an example of a snapshot from CARA Care, really helping us in terms of the percentage of bowel movement. So we're speaking apples to apples. And then Dieta is, again, a little bit more next gen in terms of its uh, availability. After seven days, the AI algorithm kicks in and then can start analyzing your data. Again, just being really cautious of not going too far with this because I have had patients where this drove some anxiety for them. So really trying to just know you well and know what's going to work for you. So a few pro tips here in terms of digital assessment is really knowing yourself that if it's going to increase your anxiety, then just stop it, OK? Also recognizing, and I say this all the time, perfection is the enemy of good when it comes to both assessing your bowel habits and also shooting for treatment targets. Because we're you know, shooting for the unicorn Bristol stool, Bristol 4 stool every day is honestly going to set us up not for success. We want to really just focus on overall trends of am I more leaning to this side or the other side. And that's what we'll focus on for our treatment goals of Bristol three to five most days is really kind of our sweet spot. Um, and then I wouldn't necessarily print out the data that you're doing from these things. Try to synthesize it into this IBS snapshot one pager that we'll talk about now. OK, um, so it's all about empowerment. If empowerment increases, then continue it. If you feel like your empowerment is decreasing or just getting too chaotic, just stop it. Okay. 
So how do we set up the snapshot from a testing perspective? So if these have already been done, and I'm not going to go on a deep dive into this, you can look into this um, later and take a, a picture if you want. Uh, these are kind of really high yield um, lab work that's done ahead of time, if done within the past you know, year or even few years type of thing. Um, stool studies that can be helpful, stool inflammatory markers, infection markers. Um, imaging, if you've had belly x-rays, if you've had CT scans, so we don't necessarily need to repeat them per se, um, depending upon the situation or the type of CT scan it was. And then scope, so we're not reinventing the wheel necessarily. If you've had you know, adequate endoscopies, colonoscopies in the past, biopsy reports are helpful, the images are a little less important. Um, but, and I will talk about in a second how our referral process works here, because our referral coordinators do an amazing job of this. So now I've talked about this IBS snapshot a ton. What does that look like? So really now synthesizing all this information that we talked about is really figuring out what are my predominant symptoms. Man, I'm really a Bristol type 6 to 7 person. If you have the percentage, you know, that can be really helpful over a two-week snapshot. Um, the abdominal pain gets better after I have a bowel movement. It happens several days a week. What are the triggers that I've kind of figured out through all of this? I've really figured out that garlic and onions, those are very common triggers for patients with IBS, um, eating out, stress. Um, and then prior testing. So really just even summarizing the names of the tests can be fine and the results can be attached, but really can help provide a, a nice snapshot. Previous treatments, right? So we talked about that, just kind of laying it out um, there in terms of what was the treatment, how long was I on it, and then what was my reason for stopping it? And there can be a variety of different reasons. You can see one there was just one dose, and then, you know, so how do we rework that? Could it still be potentially helpful now that we know some symptoms or side effects? And then really overarching, what is your main goal for the visit? I want to leave home without worrying about diarrhea very reasonable goal that we should be focused on um, empowering you together to achieve. Are there specific concerns that you have and then specific treatments that you're interested in, such as dietary options or things that you're not interested in and oftentimes the antidepressant discussion happens um, and we can discuss some kind of misinformation surrounding that. So how does the VMFHGI referral process work? So your provider places a referral. Our phenomenal VMFHGI referral team coordinators kind of help to collect that data. Um, prior records test, we'll request more sometimes if we feel like some more testing could be really helpful before the visit. And then the appointment gets scheduled. During that time while you're waiting, you can work on developing your IBS snapshot in preparation for the visit to really empower you and the provider that you're seeing to make um, a really quality time together an optimal um, visit. Now, in my practice specifically, um, when patients are scheduled, um, I encourage them to work on this IBS snapshot if possible. They arrive for the visit and then I have them, or our staff has them fill out these steps one to five to equip us to empower you for the visit together. So this is an example of one of the, of the forms. It really goes through some really high yield symptoms that are just helpful to know if you're having a yes or a no in that realm. It takes on average patients five, max 10 minutes, honestly. And if you've done the snapshot beforehand, you're already equipped with all the tools to be able to answer these questions. And the last thing is to really personalize it for you. Like, are you one who really wants the full meal deal workup in the testing comprehensive category? Or are you a more, I want to keep it simple. It's going to overwhelm me if we do too much. Everyone is different and we really want to, you know, focus it in on you and what your preferences would be. And also the specific, specific types of treatments that you would find most helpful, whether it be medications or nutrition or those types of things. So focusing on the empowerment as always. So we're just going to do a very brief overarching view, and this is by no means the purpose of, of going through the evidence hardcore, but just to show you the breadth of options that we have for IBS diarrhea. Kind of a, a stoplight system here of if it's in green, go for it if your provider approves. If it's in yellow, there's, it's promising, but there's more data needed. And then red, at least right now, is likely not worth your time or money based off the evidence that we have. So in the natural supplement realm, so soluble fiber and prebiotic, for IBS diarrhea. Prebiotics is essentially fiber a lot of times. 
Um, those are definitely have a role. Um, probiotics, I do think actually have a role as well, but there's so many out there that I think it's best done with a guided discussion with your provider. In the herbal realm, Iberagast um, is an herbal um, thing that has a lot of evidence behind it, especially for upper GI symptoms, peppermint oil. Um, and then the, there are other ones here that I do think warrant some discussion and possibility, um, but in a more nuanced discussion with your provider. As far as diets, far and away the low FODMAP diet, which is best best done with the guidance of a nutritionist um, because it is very restrictive, but it's not a forever diet. Um, and that can be really helpful and empowering for patients, especially as they start to liberalize their diet more. Some other diets have less evidence behind them. Um, now, complementary treatment, so exercise definitely has a role in IBS um, in terms of symptom navigation and yoga to a certain extent as well. Um, acupuncture I put here in red I think acupuncture has a role, um, more for our constipated patients, actually, um, but less for our diarrhea patients. And then the GI behavioral health tools, so cognitive behavioral health and gut-directed hypnotherapy, which we'll talk about a little bit more in detail. Um, as far as specific medications, again, this is a very overarching view of there are things to hit the brakes in terms of slow the gut transit down. There are cramping calmers to help with those gut spasms that can happen. Um, affecting the gut microbiome, rifaximin is by far the most evidence-based treatment, but we're limited sometimes by insurance coverage and things like that. Um, then we're going into our brain-gut axis a little bit, so our sensitive nerve settlers, so low-dose antidepressants can be extremely helpful for patients. I think it helps with having a nuanced discussion about side effects that a lot of patients end up their bodies end up adapting to over time. And in some ways, we microdose it. A lot of times, we don't need full on depression dosings um, that are needed for other conditions. Um, and then command center control. So our GI behavioral health modalities can be really helpful. So I've talked about this a lot. What does that actually mean? So tools to help fine tune the brain gut static that can happen in terms of this communication in our symphony. So when you have the stress, then sometimes it leads to abdominal pain, diarrhea, those types of things. Now there are certain apps that I'll show you in a second that can be helpful as well as certain psychologists actually that can be helpful in terms of kind of modulating this static and turning it down, ultimately leading more to a kind of a calming um, or addressing some of the hypervigilance or the bowel-related anxiety that patients have, ultimately leading more to a better bowel habit experience. So what are these evidence-based tools? So for patients, they're different. There are some more internally motivated patients versus some externally motivated patients. So for those patients who feel like they need less hand-holding, they're pretty motivated themselves. Gut-directed hypnotherapy, which actually that term, I think I like meditation or visualization a little bit better um, because it's not like old-timey watch swinging type of thing, and these are really powerful tools for some patients. So NERVA is an evidence-based um, app, and then Regulora as well as an evidence-based app. I would avoid these, though, if you have any active symptoms of PTSD, post-traumatic stress, or out-of-body experiences. Those would be contraindications. Um, for our IBS cognitive behavioral therapy, Zemedy has evidence behind it, and then Mahana actually has probably some of the most evidence behind it from randomized controlled trial data. And then our GI pain psychologists can also be really helpful, and a lot of them have uh, virtual platforms, and we have a pain psychologist we're incredibly blessed to have on staff. So again, I'm just going to highlight this very briefly. So products here, what's the commitment level? And then the cost, recognizing that Regulora is actually FDA approved or is going through that process, so does require a prescription. Um, and then in our IBS cognitive behavioral therapies, so Zemedy um, has evidence behind it. And Mahana is FDA approved, but it does require a prescription as well. So in some senses, that can make the process a little bit more um, clunky, but can still definitely happen. So and, and it's very powerful tools for some patients. So there's a lot of IBS tools, right? Um, and this isn't at all meant to overwhelm you. It's meant to empower you. So in summary here, what's our tracking? So IBS snapshot can be really helpful for that. Um, there are many evidence-based GI health strategies. And then there are a lot of tools to help fine-tune that brain-gut health. 
So we are here to help you at VMFH. We have specialists in nutrition and in integrative medicine. Um, we use microbiome type treatments, pelvic floor physical therapy, which I'm sure Diana will be talking about, psychiatry um, and behavioral health all can create a holistic patient experience for you, even if it's not necessarily with one provider, but team members that we can um, work with each other collaboratively to get you your bowel-related quality of life back. I think a tree is a really powerful metaphor, at least for me, in terms of going through hard things, of having roots to really weather life's storm, and we're here to help give you roots. So at Virginia Mason Franciscan Health, it's by no means just me. We have an integrated team here of myself and Diana, as well as several other GI-specific providers that are focused in this area. We have our phenomenal group of GI nutritionists that are helping us out in a big way. Um, our pain psychologist, Jennifer Kelly, has developed a phenomenal program in her own right. We have integrative medicine providers who are both MDs and integrative medicine trained, which is a phenomenal resource to have. We have great colorectal surgeons who are compassionate. Same thing with our urogyne surgeons, general surgeons with Dr. Lily Chang. Um, our clinical pharmacists are a tremendous resource to guide our patients through their neuromodulation sometimes of those medicines. Um, and then psychiatry, we have collaborations with them, as well as our physical medicine and rehabilitation, our pain group, essentially, with our interventional pain and our uh, medical pain group. And who knows who else could be part of that team, and maybe you would want to be part of that team as a patient, um, a patient partner, really to transform this bowel chaos into more bowel control. So finally, I just want to say a big thank you for sticking in with us during our presentations today. Um, and hopefully, you just really feel like there is hope for these conditions, both from hearing from my colleague Diana for constipation and then myself talking about diarrhea. And really looking forward to the Q&A session after this, where we can chat about um, any specific questions that you have. So once again, thank you so much for listening, and um, have a great day.